Well, it's always a pleasure to welcome Tom Emmerich back to the MSU Today Microphones. Tom is the president of Shoe Pan Recycling, but also the chief operating officer for Shoe Pans and Sons Incorporated. Tom, great to have you back. Yeah, thanks, uh, Russ. Always great to see you, too. Catch up. And always appreciate your support for MSU Today and Spartan Athletics. Thank you. Yeah, I don't see that changing for some time. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's... Before we talk about really the main issue you came in, which is a little bit of a disturbing drop in, in bottles being returned, to, who and what is Shoe Pan? What's the mission and some of the history? The history keeps getting longer because I guess <laughs> as time goes on, so does, so does your history. But Shoe Pan and Sons is a, a Kalamazoo-based Michigan company. We're primarily uh, started out in the uh, ferrous scrap, not, excuse me, the non-ferrous scrap, which is basically aluminum. And we're very strong in that space. So uh, we started out in uh, in the non-ferrous scrap business. We do handle ferrous metals. We've evolved into an aluminum and plastics manufacturing and distribution operation. We have a um, shoe pan recycling, which you reference is our beverage container recycling arm of the business, which handles a lot of the state's deposit containers. And then uh, most recently, we started a, a trading division uh, where we're now buying and selling mostly uh, non ferrous scrap all over the world. I think we did business in over 25 countries last year. Um, and then we have an e-scrap business. We have a sustainability uh, uh, services uh, portion of the organization. So all that's kind of grown over the last 54 years and was, of course, started by uh, Mark Chupan's father. And uh, um, Mark came back to help his dad out. We've We've talked about yes. this. Your listeners probably don't care that much, but it's kind of the, kind of the fiber of who we are. And he also we went from I think it was six or seven employees. We now have uh, six hundred and fifty, almost seven hundred employees, depending on the time of year. We service the Midwest, uh, but we're still very very Michigan rooted. And to go back to Mark's philosophy, uh, he always say, "Oh, I want to make I want to make another percent," which is that always cracks me up because it's true. I mean, we do. You, know, you can't you can't do all the things that he does for the community. Um, if you don't do that, uh, but he, he gives back. He really, he truly gives back and the whole company gives back, uh, to all the communities of which, which, uh, we do business in. And, um, it's really special and, and, um, kind of heartwarming to work for an organization that, you know, walks the walk, so to speak. So in a nutshell, that's who yeah. Shoe Pan is. I probably gave you guys nope. way too much information. No, but, that's uh, good. And uh, so let's talk about Michigan's bottle deposit return law started in 1978. I know you've said before, arguably the most successful piece of legislation maybe ever in the history of Michigan. But And we've always returned about 90% of our bottles to get that dime. But the Department of Treasury about a month ago released some some information that we're down to like 75%. So what what's going on? Yeah, that's the, that's the million-dollar question. I, I, you said arguably, and I say I, I, I say it's arguably, but maybe not so arguably. Yeah. I mean, it really is a very, very popular piece of legislation. And if you pool people today, Michiganders today, that still comes in over ninety percent pretty regularly on the favorability uh, of the of our deposit law and our deposit system. So, um, segue into your your question of um, the Treasury uh, Department sets out a report every year around April, early May where they tally up the unclaimed deposits and they'll tell you through that same report, like how much, you know, what was your actual return rate of all deposit containers. So prior to the pandemic, we pretty regularly were over 99, excuse me, over 90% return rate for all deposit containers. Post pandemic, we've been consistently at 75%. Um, For a number of reasons, you know, we find that troubling and problematic. Uh, But, you know, the question is, well, geez, what happened? And, during the pandemic, and I'm not claiming anybody's right, wrong, or indifferent. I've probably said this on here before, but Michigan was the only state in the country to shut their deposit system down completely for about 12 weeks. And I just think that created an opportunity for um, people to change their behavior. You know, a lot of folks stockpiled them, a lot of charities collected a lot of, lot of containers, and when the system was opened back up, those that's like kind of sat on the most of the container, the, the greatest amount of containers had the most problematic time bringing them back. Retailers were very strict about enforcing the twenty-five dollar limit, which I understand that completely, um, and that law was all that was always part of the state law. So it just at the end of the day, you know, you always get into my four E's of re- sustainability will, yes. recycling, but <laughs> but convenience, ease, and convenience is so important to any recycling effort and. And if that gets disrupted, 
it makes it easier for folks to to change their mind and change their behavior. So, you know, we just came out of Memorial Weekend. We're heading into the summer. These are the hottest uh, months of the year. This is where the most deposit containers are consumed. It's a great time for Michiganders, a great time in the state. People are vacationing and traveling, et cetera. So we feel that, that as the deposit uh, rate has declined to the 75%, that uh, it's a great time to try to re-educate folks. I don't think most people really even understand what happens to containers once they take them back to retail or what the big issue is or that we've dropped off this much. And when you talk about going from 90 plus percent to 75 percent, when we're redeeming only 75 percent of our containers, that means there's roughly a hundred million dollars of unclaimed dimes that goes to the state. And they, you know, they use it for environmental cleanup sites and things like that. And then 25 percent goes to retailers. But at the end of the day, it's still Michiganders are giving up a hundred million dollars a year. And we think that's significant. And um, and we'd like to think that, uh, well, I don't think, I know we as a state could do better and it's time to kind of trying to put some effort back into getting to getting back to the 90 plus percent because we can do it but it's going to start with the individual that said that says it to themselves hey i'm not putting this in the landfill god forbid or curbside or whatever which nothing wrong with curbside other than you're giving up your dime and so anyways and really the more product you get back the more you can recycle and the more sustainable everything can be you want more product yeah, absolutely so so that's the other other piece. One of the beauties of a deposit system is it creates the cleanest recycled material for the beverage industry to make new cans and bottles out of. So when Michigan's rate drops like it has, that's really impactful to the rest to the whole industry nationally in 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 making new aluminum cans. You know, the the, the brand owners we call them the the Cokes, the Pepsi's, the uh, Keurig, Dr Pepper, uh, Snapple. Anheuser Busch, uh, Miller Coors, etc. They all have very, very aggressive uh, return to con- uh, recycling content uh, goals and objectives um, for putting, um, you know, making new bottles and cans with as much recycled material as possible. Deposits systems just create the highest quality, lowest cost to them to make that happen. So yeah, it's 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 a, it's part of closing the loop, and it is incredibly important to overall recycling. And it should be a real people ask, well, why do you care that it's only seventy five percent? And and um, you know that's a that's a big part of the reason yeah. sustainability and reducing carbon footprints and all the you know that's a huge role to make that happen. And the aluminum industry in particular has been been uh, very very aggressive about implementing sustainability, and they call it green metals. There's a plant being built in uh, Cassopolis, <laughs> Michigan, by a aluminum company, a huge aluminum billet company named Hydro. And the whole purpose behind the plant is to, to manufacture new billet out of uh, green metals, which is recycled material. Now, aluminum can scrap doesn't go into that process, but a lot of other non-ferrous metals do. And we're, we're, we'll be a supplier to that uh, uh, location. And that's... You know, that's kind of exciting for the whole aluminum industry because they're not the only plant that's being built. There's major investments going on. Um, there were last year three new aluminum can sheet manufacturing plants announced to be built in the United States. which is the first time in like over, I don't know, 40 years or something like that. And I think only two of them are going to happen, but and we don't need to get into all the details there. But it shows the industry is really, really um, um, aggressively pursuing uh lower carbon output material and again i'll take that back to the michigan deposit law and any deposit system um you know high quality material is is a great place for them to start to accomplish their goals and they get it from shoe pans so the more you get the more you can give them and the more we have our circular right. and they're all there's and they're shaking their head going geez what happened to the volume coming out of the state of michigan well, and how does glass play into this time are you mainly wanting plastic and alumina or what about the glass well, if you circle back to like like who is shoe pan recycling? What, yeah. do, we, what do we do? We're um, uh, we're a service provider. So when the deposit law was passed in 1978, ish, um, and implemented, it was put at the feet of the distributors in particular. It's really a distributor-run program, and they're responsible for initiating the dime, uh, collecting it at retail, giving the dime back to retail and following the container through the process and then efficiently disposing of the container. So they were not, you know, they're not allowed to landfill deposit containers. So that's aluminum, plastic, and glass. So 
I wouldn't say we're just primarily concerned with aluminum and plastic because we're a service provider to the industry where we handle all three commodities. You know, glass is a huge component to the process. You know, everybody wants the aluminum because it, it's you know, high value and, and kind of pays for itself in most cases. Uh, PET is kind of goes up and down and it's kind of in the middle of the road. But glass is expensive to uh, uh, pick up, process, handle. You know, when you put glass at, at, uh, at, at, in a cur- within a curbside program, again, we've gotten way better at curbside over the years. So I, I respect what they've done tremendously. But glass breaks. When glass breaks, it contaminates everything else. So that becomes a little problematic for the MRF. You just you know, if you ask anybody that runs a, a single stream recycling operation, it's glass is very expensive for them. So deposits pull that out of the system. So sometimes you got to take the good, the bad with the good, right? That's that's how I look at at uh, deposits. And Tom, you mentioned improvement in recycling. How is Michigan doing? For a while, Michigan wasn't as good at curbside as some of its Midwest neighbors, and. We had talked about some bills that were moving through the state because really, in, in some ways, you can't blame the municipalities if it's cheaper to throw the stuff into a landfill than recycle it, right? So are we getting better at curbside? A study came out, I think, about a year ago that showed that we had a 19% increase in our overall municipal recycling rate. So that suggests yes. And and I know we are because we've had more programs pop up over uh, since um, really the <laughs> Well, as the, the state, back what used to be DEQ, now it's Eagle, put a very strong effort uh, behind trying to help communities with more sustainable curbside programs and single stream recycling, et cetera. So, so they've had an impact, and that's really, really positive. Of course, that, you know, personally, professionally, I, I believe that you know the best systems are ones that have good curbside programs and good deposit systems, and it's pretty much been, that's pretty proven out. I think it's six of the top ten states for recycling have uh, have deposit systems in them. So, you know, you, you could have both and accomplish the goals that we're all trying to achieve: it's a cleaner environment, lower carbon yeah. emissions, et cetera. I think sometimes people are still confused: what can I put in the bin and what can I? Right? Can I put the pizza box in or not? And I guess each place would be different. So you need to check with whoever picks up your recycling. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. I. I get around the country quite a bit and different curbside repro- curbside programs do it uh some are better com- at communicating than others but the answer is always out there yeah. if the consumer wants to pick up the phone and call their provider and just find out what can i put in there what should i put in there what should i put in there etc they can do it but again they, I, I, still from a recycling standpoint it's it's about ease and convenience and and when uh when you don't have that it's a it's a big strike against any recycling effort good time for me to ask you to always <laughs> share your four e's of a successful recycling program let's see if i can remember them. <laughs> <laughs> i made them up like 25 <laughs> years ago so the fir- first one was education because you got to know what can, what can be recycled like we just talked about recycled and how and where to go to do it uh, the second one is ease, which we've talked about that, which is so important. And I, again, when I look at the Michigan deposit system uh, and why has it declined, I think it just hasn't been as easy co- for consumers to take their containers back to retail. Um, not every retailer. Uh, some retailers have, have done a great, most have done a great job, especially your large ones. Um, but in r- more rural communities, uh, they have um, you know, they don't take them back as simply and as easy as they used to. So the ease suffers. But, so anyway, so education, ease, and then you have to have efficient logistics, which is kind of where I think a shoe pan comes into play and where, uh, you know, as I mentioned, it's a distributor-run program. Well, they can't do it as cost-effectively as they've done if they don't engage with companies like shoe pan. They can help them because that's what we do. We pick up, we process, we do it as cost-effectively as possible. And then I'll go back to the overall Michigan deposit system when you look at um, distributors and retailers and recyclers and and consumers, we've all worked very closely together, in particular retailers and distributors, to improve the process of Michigan over the years to make it the lowest cost by far process in the country just deposit system. Um, so I'm very proud of that. We should all be really proud of that. And then um, the last thing is, which might be the hardest, is efficient uh, is uh, economically viable markets. Um, if you don't have some place to sell your material that you've collected, your program is not going to make it. It just won't. So I've always said 
you, you kind of need all four of those if you're going to truly have a successful, um, sustainable recycling program. So, Tom, again, we are a little bit disappointed in the return rate for our uh, bottles and cans. Make your pitch for people to take them back. <laughs> Well, yeah, we kind of like that, uh, I'll call it a slogan, take them back. We want that to be synonymous with somebody in Michigan sees that, yeah, as a reminder to take your containers back to your nearest local retail store because it's just the right thing to do. I like this phrase, too. It's your lakes, it's your roads, it's your beaches, and it's your dime. So take them back. It's the right thing for you, it's the right thing for the state, and it's the right thing for the environment. So in a nutshell, that's that's really what we're saying. We could get back to being the number one uh, return state, deposit, beverage, container, recycling state. Uh, it won't take a lot of effort, but uh, we got to do the right thing. And, and, again, it starts with the consumer. And we're hoping that as we get more attention from folks like you, so I appreciate the opportunity to share the story um, and share what's going on. And maybe if it sparks one or two people to start bringing their containers back that stopped, then, then we're doing the right thing and we'll be moving in the right direction. And more returns only leads to more a better environment. So, Absolutely. Tom, thanks Absolutely. for coming in and reminding us today. Thank you. That's, Anytime. That's Tom Emmer, Chief Operating Officer of ShoePan and President of ShoePan Recycling. Much more at ShoePan.com, S-C-H-U-P-A-N.com, ShoePan.com. And I'm Russ White. This is MSU.